Welcome to another episode of The Watchdog. Thank you for joining us. This week we have a very, very special guest who has caused quite a stir with her important film. Now, as you know, weekly we are going against the grain, covering stories which are regularly marginalized in the mainstream media. For that reason, we hope you can support us by sharing, liking, and subscribing to this video and this channel. Now, this week we will be discussing the film Farha, which has been released on Netflix and deals specifically with the Nakba of 1948 and the creation of Israel as a political entity on top of the ruins and the remains of a Palestinian civilization which endures until today in spite of the complicated and sophisticated military machine placed on top of it. And we are lucky enough to be joined by the director of the film, Darin Salam who is joining us from Jordan today to talk about the film. Thank you so much, Darin. How are you today? Hi, Karim, and thank you for having me. Thanks very much for joining us. And just to start with, if you could break down for us the film Farha and your involvement in it. So Farha is uh, my debut feature. It's, um, it's a coming-of-age film. I'm the writer and director of it. Uh, it's uh, it's the story of a 14-year-old Palestinian girl uh, whose dream is to get an education in the city uh, because her village has school only for boys. So um, um, this dream changes from from getting an education. Her dream changes from getting an education in the city to surviving a room that she was she was locked up in by her father to protect her life when uh, the Haganah soldiers invaded the, their village. And basically, it's inspired by true events. Um, I had the story when I was a child because I heard it when I was a child and it stayed with me. And when I became a film director, I just found myself writing the script and I felt the urge to share the story with the world. And finally, I'm happy I, I am now. I mean, there are those that say touching the wounds of the past as a process in art can in and of itself be something that helps us produce, in some cases, serotonin, increased serotonin production is one of the ways in which we can help our sort of process our trauma in some ways. Um, did you feel that writing this was something that, it, you know, there must have been some very, very tough times in writing it. It must have taken you on a real emotional journey. But overall, do you feel it's been a sort of cathartic process? Actually, it was um, it was it wasn't easy to uh, because you know part of the my homework as a writer and as a director was to do a lot of research, hear a lot of oral history uh, of people who uh, who witnessed uh, these horrible events uh, and the, the killings and the, what happened in Al Nakba and uh, it was it was painful. Um, uh, to hear people talking about the smallest things that they missed in their houses, in their lives in Palestine before 1948, um, but also the, the traumas they went through, uh, um, um, like how, how scared they were of, of rape incidents and like, like they left because and left, they left thinking that they will be back, but they never were able to. So, I mean, hearing all of these stories was painful to me. But also it gave me motivation in, in times where I was um, uh, facing a lot of obstacles. Uh, um, many are trying to convince me to change or remove this killing scene in the film, uh, which is nothing compared to what happened. But I mean, like it was uh, whenever I felt down uh, hearing these stories and reading um, about um, people and what they witnessed made me like, motivated and gave, gave me like more strength and made me stronger the the weight of history is very tangible with this uh film we could say and you know when we think about the way that the haganah or the palmach as they are also known 
are represented sometimes they're viewed as being from a certain section of the zionist movement a zionist a, a section of the movement which actually has been given a bit of a cosmetic job when people look at the ben gurion side of the zionist movement they say oh well you know this is not as extreme as the jabotinsky side but you know the haganah were involved in so many um examples of cleansing and displacing people um so it's you know fantastic that a film like this can shed light on uh, that aspect of uh, of the story i mean we also know that the film has come up against opposition from the israeli government um avigdor lieberman of all people who himself was one of the only foreign ministers ever in the world to actually simultaneously live in an illegal settlement outside the quote unquote borders of the state that he represented while he was foreign minister claimed that this film farha is quote unquote inciting against israeli soldiers now the same charge of incitement actually has been used um about my music by a israel lobby group in this country called we believe in israel which attempted to remove it from spotify and you know when you look at the the war against art um expressing and and articulating this on freedom you have for example the uh, case of darin tatur this was a poet who wrote on her facebook page qawim ya sha'bi qawimhum a beautiful poem calling for her steadfast people to resist this and what she went through was then a 3 year legal ordeal on the very basement basis of incitement for her work um and spent quite a long time in prison you know during the time that darin tatur was in prison she actually used the zip from her hoodie to write poetry on the walls of her cell because she was told that you especially you will not be given a pen and a paper so this is the way in which a you know some people say you know their all states have a military but israel is a military with a state and so when everything is viewed through the lens of a military understanding even things like art like film like books and you know the 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 war on palestinian literature is also um not documented enough but it also has been documented um these are kind of interesting ways in which your uh beautiful film about human suffering and the the will of human beings to survive any situation has been warped in the image of uh israel so what would be your response to somebody who would say that this film is an incitement towards uh israeli soldiers um actually it was more than one um uh, israeli official that attacked the film and and accused uh, uh like or tried to to doubt the credibility of the film um and the answer is um it's based on um true events and this killing scene that they're very upset about is just a drop in the ocean of like compared to what happened back in 1948 it's nothing compared to what happened really and if they have a problem of watching the truth it's not my uh, uh fault uh, if truth hurts uh but i mean i i say that they can't silence our voices and uh, they try to um, to stop the film of uh, streaming on netflix uh, but the film is now out and it's in every house and every like uh, in every heart really literally from from everywhere from all over the world we're receiving messages and emails uh, and and people are learning about the nakba uh, not the catastrophe the war the nakba they're googling the nakba they're learning about it it's being an uh, an eye opener um, uh, which is very important so my answer is denying the nakba and denying that these killings happened and the ethnic cleansing uh, happened is denying of uh, like it's denying of uh, a tragedy that a nation went through and it's inhumane and uh, and we will not accept this and we will keep speaking our side of the narrative and we will let our voices reach everywhere 
um, and and they ask me for 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 a proof. It's like some journalists asked me, sent me an email uh, saying uh, we want a proof that this happened. Like uh, like they uh, they call them the moral, uh, the most moral uh, army in the world. So uh, so I of course I didn't answer them, but I'll answer now with you. I'm gonna answer, and my response is that a document. If you want a document, I'm not gonna ask. Uh, I'm not gonna say the. Uh, typical answer, which is go check oral history or uh, ethnic cleansing by Ilan Pape or uh, archive your archives, or check maybe the the, the Haganah soldiers who are still alive and who are speaking and saying that we killed while laughing uh, in documentaries like Al Tantura uh, by an Israeli uh, filmmaker. But I'm gonna say that I am a document, uh, I am a proof. Denying al Nakba is denying that I exist and denying that it's part of my identity and who I am. Uh, 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 like the Palestinians that were that were killed all over, like all these years, are documents. Uh, the Palestinians who are living around the world, millions of Palestinians in the diaspora, are documents. Uh, Shirin Abu Aqle is a document. Iman Hajro, who is who was four months old when she was killed. I can't remember the the weapon she was carrying back then when she was killed, but I can't forget her image. Is a document. Uh, every Palestinian who's disabled, who lost an eye or like an arm or a leg or disabled because of the killings of the Israelis is a document. So we are all documents and, and this is the truth and they can't just deny us. Powerful, very powerfully said. Um, and you know, the thing is, is many people view the Zionist movement as being represented on two poles from Ben Gurion on the quote unquote what they called the left to Vladimir Jabotinsky on what they called the right. Both of these people actually had um, consensus on one thing. They both had consensus on the fact that Palestinians were indigenous, whether it was Ben Gurion writing in 1915 or whether it was Vladimir Jabotinsky writing in his book, The Iron Wall. They had a clear understanding that what they were doing was a colonial project. It only seems to be new age Zionists who are in some form of denial about the nature of the state building project and what it entailed. Jabotinsky clearly says, you know, and just so people understand, so the audience understand how important Jabotinsky is to the idea of Israel. He has more roads, streets, cinemas, parks, schools named after him in 1948 in what they call Israel than any other political figure historically, more than Theodore Herzl, more than any of the others. And Jabotinsky says clearly in his book, The Iron Wall, any population will resist alien invaders. So he directly references the Zionist movement himself and others as alien invaders. And if you actually look at Jabotinsky's um, political orientation, where he felt he had a kinship in the world, he clearly understood himself as a fascist. He clearly saw kinship and an affinity with um, particular fascist movements in Eastern Europe and, of course, Mussolini. He was uh, greatly enamored with Mussolini. So this is just the reality and the truth of history. Um, the interesting thing that I found also, though, was that, you know, um, Netflix is a platform that has featured films that have been made with involvement of figures from Israeli intelligence and Israeli military. So there's the Eli Cohen film. There's, of course, the series Folder, which many see. So it was a surprise for me, you know, and I'm saying this from my perspective as an audience member. It was a surprise to see a film like Farha get through that um seemingly hegemonic um sort of role at the platform can you explain you know what that process was like and 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 how and how you did it how you achieved something that seemed from the outside it, as a layman it seemed like it would be almost impossible how, how did you manage it yeah i mean um so some people um think that farha is uh, because it's on Netflix, it's a Netflix original. They don't know the difference. So Farha is uh, not a Netflix original. It was produced uh, by uh, a Jordanian production company, Tailbox, 
um, uh, with the co-production from Sweden. But um, after the film was um, out and it had its uh, world premiere uh, in Toronto International Film Festival, I'm very proud, by the way, of this screening because Toronto are really the bravest film festival because other film festivals are afraid to screen for her. So I really have respect for this festival. I love it. And it's the, like, I didn't, like, I, I don't think the world premiere was going to be any, like, it was amazing. I mean, I, I really have respect because as I said, festivals were afraid of Farha. Not all of them, some of them. Um, so it's one of the bravest. So after the, the, the film screening in Toronto, the film started touring festivals around Europe, around, it, it's literally like everywhere now. Uh, in Japan, uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, Australia, uh, everywhere. And then um, after a year and a half, we met with Netflix and uh, they acquired the film to stream it uh, worldwide. And I think this is one of the things that made them very angry, uh, the, the Israeli officials, because usually most of the of the Arab movies are uh, stream, streaming um, MENA region, but Farha was worldwide. Um, and they don't want the world to know about this Nakba event that they were hiding for so long. So, um, so yeah, I mean, when, when the attack happened, we didn't try to reach out to Netflix. We were waiting to see what will happen. And we didn't have to because Netflix like moved on and put it on, on, on their platform and like we didn't contact them even. Uh, and I really have respect for them. Uh, the year before, Netflix put around 20 movies, Palestinian movies. Uh, so I think they're trying to, to, uh, to show more the, the Arab or the Palestinian uh, story. Um, yeah, I mean, and then Farha. Um, although they got a lot of threats, by the way. They received many th threatening because we, we were CC'd on some of the emails. Uh, yeah, uh, and they were like uh, a lot of uh, ugly emails. So, but they moved on. So I have respect actually for them for doing this. Fantastic. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about the way that the Israel lobby operates and operates here and operates in the US also is it's very, very top heavy. So it focuses on pressuring institutions and it actually alienates quite a lot of people in the process and it struggles with winning hearts and minds. So it's uh, it's quite an interesting uh, a series of events to play out. And, you know, I'm in absolutely no doubt that there will be people looking at this fantastic achievement and contribution to the 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 wide body of work that is out there about the Nakba and about Palestine and, and looks at Netflix and thought, you know, I would never dream this would happen. There will be young aspiring writers, filmmakers, directors out there who will look at this and say, this is fantastic. And if you were able to give them any advice that they could use to really push through and and get to this point where they can achieve not only something in the mainstream achieving something in the mainstream is hard enough when coming from particular backgrounds which are viewed a particular way throughout the war on terror but on top of it being able to be in that space and directly assert a political point which is difficult for that mainstream to absorb um, and assimilate is an even bigger achievement so those who are hoping to not only put themselves out there but also achieve something for their people and for the civilization from which they come. What kind of advice could you give to those young people? Uh, I think that the first thing I would advise them is um, to be truthful. Um, because um, to be sincere, because this is something that will stay with you. You will, you will have to travel the world with this film. And you will have to stand in front of hundreds and thousands of people in screenings, uh, in uh, screening rooms, and you will have to answer their questions. Uh, you have to defend 
this film like forever and and you need to be again uh, truthful and sincere and uh, and loyal uh, because um if you make a film about palestine or if you want to make a film about palestine you need to have th- like you need to have ethics and it's a huge responsibility you need to have ethics your your principles and 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 values uh because many will try to change your mind and tell you why don't you delete this scene like what happened with me just remove this scene and you will get funded easily no i prefer to wait three years and to make it with my like ethics and principles and values you know and this is my advice stay uh, loyal and and stick to your principles um because it's a huge responsibility uh, you know um kareem for example with, with farha um like because I, I i said the truth i wasn't afraid to 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 face uh, um the attacks and and talk and speak about the film um i mean the most satisfying thing and emotional thing is receiving messages from people who watched the film and witnessed the nakba for example, a woman who's in her 80s saying, I'm Farha, uh, or, or someone who says, my grandmother is Farha, or my mother is Farha, uh, every girl, we are all Farha. This is something, I mean, um, it's amazing. Some people are telling me that they, they found out after watching the film that they have intergenerational trauma. And some are telling me it's connecting generations. We're sitting like different generations watching the film together and crying together. It's It's like, we have we should, like we need to understand that the how powerful is cinema it's it's it can it can make difference now critics are um, like some many critics are are saying that uh, farha is a groundbreaking uh, film and and now um, they're expecting that we're not expecting they're saying it's it will be the launch of the nakba genre in film and I'm, like I, I'm very honored and I, I, I really want this to happen because um, because it's it's about time that we speak up and we are heard and people know about this this uh, like know that the, like no treat Palestinians as humans finally and not numbers. And you know, you think about the work of people like Walid Khalidi or Salman Abu Sitta, these are people that have gone to great lengths to document these events but some of the problem i feel is being able to reach the younger generation because you know this was one of the things that the the zionists always said they said the the old will die and the young will forget and actually a film like this is the direct antidote and the biggest piece of evidence that that is not true because it's saying not only will we tell the stories and just expect the young to come to us, because they already do, but we will bring the story to young people. If you were to look at uh, the key ways, unfortunately, that a lot of young people, especially in uh, English speaking societies who are so heavily propagandized, you know, you look at the US and Britain, these are definitely the most propagandized civilizations. Um, in history, actually, even in terms of exposure to image, there was a study carried out that looked at the amount of images a person would see in their daily life around 100 years ago and compared to how many images a person sees day to day in their life now in the United States. And the it was a real um, an exponential increase in the exposure to image. You know, and and with that, you also get the movement from a print based reading culture to a screen based image culture. And so within that, the the importance of Netflix in terms of uh, communicating to people ideas of the past and how we got to where we are and really excavating the, 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 the details and the intricacies of the past. A lot of it for young people is happening through moving image. And so, and so what has happened is you've been able to take this to young people where they are, to speak to them in a language that they understand. And it would be absolutely amazing if this was <clears throat> to lead to the emergence of a, a genre, a whole genre, which would tease out a lot of the, the, uh, the aspects of this. 
So, you know, it's been a real honor to interview you today. I hope that we can speak again about more films and more things uh, coming out soon. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. If you have anything, lastly, that you would like to add, you know, for instance, I feel that we may not have covered enough um, quite your just general response to actually the fact that, uh, you know, a political unit has actually taken serious measures against this film. It's almost like a war against this film, you know, and, and when you're in the sort of eye of that storm, and I think the good thing that you emphasized, which I think is important for people to, to know, is the ability to stand on your convictions. Because I think when people do not have strong conviction about what it is that they've done, it's quite easy for them to be shaken. It's quite easy for them to be moved. And let's be clear, the weight of those mechanisms is heavy. When you have key figures who are killers from governments in the world saying the name of the film and saying this is a threat to us and our domination and our what we want to do in the world that's quite a scary position to find yourself in as a person and you know to be able to withstand that pressure is a testament to the strength of your conviction and obviously this recognition of the weight of of history you know how, how did that feel to be in that position um, and and do you have any just last message you would like to give to anybody who's part of that war against this important film? Um, thank you, Karim, for for everything you said. Uh, actually, um, you're right. But I, I when they asked me how did you feel when when you like I I was what I felt I like I really wasn't afraid at all. Uh, like you said, wasn't shaken at all because as I said, because I'm saying the truth, I know the truth um like i'm saying facts uh, um i'm being sincere and and i'm i'm telling a humane story uh and so i have no like doubt of of like i'm i'm, I'm it's uh, as you said it's a recognition uh and I, i'm like i i mean it's it means it's very um emotional yeah why it's uh, it's scary to them um um, but I can say that this is why I said we need to uh, to um, uh, if if we're saying the truth, nothing will will scare us. I wasn't scared; I was only shocked, as I said, mm. uh, because because like denying that killing like the, like they killed people was shocking to me. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, are you serious? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. where do I start from? You know, this yeah, is the, yeah. the, the shock to me and the the, the timing. Yeah. Uh, the amount of how organized, yeah. how organized the campaign was to lower the the rating of the film on IMDb was shocking. Yeah. Like they're very organized, they're very um, they know what they're doing. Yeah. The the shocking part, but but no, I wasn't uh, shocked of the reaction to be honest. Yeah. Uh, but I, as you said, you said something that I I used to say when I I used to pitch the film before before shooting it when it was just a script. I used to say. Um, um, they say that the old will die and, and the young will forget. And hopefully uh, the young will remember with a film like Farha. Yeah. And I hope that this film really lives uh, yeah. and, uh, and people know more and, and spread the word about the film so they can learn and, and know our history and know that Palestine was a land with people, not, not a land without people, for people without a land. It was a land with people that had lives and uh, and dreams and uh, and uh, simple things that, that that they like sad and and happy moments and and everything yeah. and they had culture and heritage and even these things and that are being stolen now yeah. even the even the smallest things so i mean i just want people to know yeah that palestinians are suffering today because of this event because 1948 it's the beginning of everything and we have to talk about it and we have to know about it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Darin. It's been a, a wonderful conversation. Um, I wish you absolutely the best of luck and anything that we can do to support you in this uh, absolutely noble cause. Um, we are here.
Thank you to the audience for joining us this week. We hope you will join us next week on The Watchdog with me, Loki. Thank you. Thank you.